think we can start. And I would like to invite our, our speakers to unmute their cameras. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Alejandro Baer. I'm the director of the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at the University of Minnesota. Uh, we have uh, participants who are joining us uh, from many places uh, acro across the, the globe, from Argentina, from Canada, from Spain, from Germany. From Germany. And uh, we want to wish everyone who is joining us and our speakers a happy and meaningful International Women's Day, or as we say in Spanish, Dia de la Mujer Trabajadora. A uh, special welcome to our, our speakers, uh, Liliana Feierstein, who's joining us from Berlin, uh, Daniela Glaser, who's joining, connecting from Mexico City, and Shir Ganor, who's here in Minnesota, and Shir is also the organizer of, uh, of this talk, and we want to thank her uh, for, for doing this, for coordinating this program. I'm only doing the, the introductions and I will help sharing and, and moderating. We also thank our co-sponsors, the Center for Jewish Studies, the Department of German, Nordic and Dutch at the University of Minnesota. And uh, I also want to thank Joe Eggers, uh, who's the Assistant Director of the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies for helping putting together this program and also for creating the, the beautiful flyer that is based on images from a yearbook of the AFI, the Asociación Filantropica Israelita. And I would like to start uh, um, also situating us uh, in this in, in the topic of of this panel uh, beyond exile German Jewish encounters in Latin America by sharing an anecdote uh, that a friend uh, Raúl Lehmann, who's a former president of the AFI, um, uh, told me only a couple of years ago. AFI had been founded in 1933 as the Hilfsverein der Deutsch sprechenden Juden, the Eight Association of German Speaking. Jews. And um, after more than 50 years of being only a German speaking an institution for German speaking Jews, um, there was an internal discussion at AFI about opening, particularly the elderly home, the Hirsch home in Buenos Aires, to all Jews, not just German uh, speaking Jews. And uh, this new concept brought with it you know, very deep cultural and, and institutional changes and, and discussions and was, uh, is usually done for, for this kind of discussions. A committee uh, took on the task of doing a study on the matter. And community leaders, professionals from, from different areas were invited to uh, join this, this committee. And one of uh, the guests in one of those meetings, a businessman, said that it seemed like an excellent idea to open the, the home, the Hirsch elderly home, to the entire Jewish community. And uh, he added that uh, we could uh, incorporate uh, Polish Jews, Russian Jews, uh, even Sephardic Jews into uh, the board of directors. The only thing uh, he said uh, that he asked for is that the treasurer should be one of us, meaning uh, a German uh, speaking Jew. So I just want to, to, uh, to tell that anecdote, which is uh, obviously telling and says a lot about the organization and the environment of that time, but we'll hear so much more now from our speakers. And our first speaker is Shir Ganor, uh, who is an assistant professor of history at the University of Minnesota. And as I said, she's the coordinator and organizer um, um, of, of this uh, event. She is also an affiliate faculty member of the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies. Currently, she is working on a book manuscript in which she studies the emergence of a global diaspora of German-speaking Jews who fled uh, Nazi violence. And she teaches classes on the history of the Holocaust, comparative genocide history, human rights, and, uh, mod and modern Germany. So without uh, further ado, uh, Professor Ganor, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Alejandro, for this uh, introduction. I also want to thank the Center for Holocaust and Genocide uh, Studies at the University of Minnesota for hosting this event. Uh, special thanks to my co-panelists for joining us today. I'm so excited to hear your presentations. And many thanks to the members of the audience uh, who are joining from uh, all over the world. This is very exciting. Um, this panel generally is, a, is an exciting opportunity to uh, explore a destination of flight that um, is still uh, 
quite understudied in the history of uh, Jewish refugees in the Nazi period. Uh, certainly there are scholars like my co-panelists who have uh, produced very important studies on refugees in Latin America in the World War II era. And it is thanks to people uh, like Daniela and Liliana that we do see the region receiving more attention from historians in the field. And our panel today um, is also a part of that trend. Just to give you uh, some context about my own work and explain how I approach this topic, my research studies German-speaking Jews who escaped Central Europe from a global perspective, uh, thinking of these displaced communities as a diaspora. And what I argue is that not simply despite, but in many ways because of the displacement and the dispersion, these refugees who were scattered in different corners of the world uh, were nevertheless bound by diasporic bonds. So unlike uh, Daniela and Liliana, I'm actually not a specialist in uh, Latin America. Uh, rather, I study German-speaking Jews who fled to places like Buenos Aires, Havana, Montevideo, or Rio together and in tandem with people who ended up in London, Manila, Istanbul, um, Los Angeles, Haifa, and other places. And I highlight the ways in which these dispersed communities uh, were still very much animated by shared histories and by a shared experience of displacement. But of course, diasporas are not um, perfectly intact organic entities. Uh, they are heterogeneous uh, constructs and they can be sites of conflict as well. Uh, this certainly was the case with the German Jewish diaspora. And that's what I want to focus on today. Uh, I'll talk about the interplay and the tensions that existed between two German Jewish organizations, one based in Latin America and the other an international umbrella organization. Uh, and from the perspective of this troubled relationship between these two organizations, I'll raise some thoughts about the state of the diaspora more broadly. Let me just start sharing the screen. Okay, so the um, first uh, uh, organization that I'll uh, talk about um, was called the Council of Jews from Germany. It was uh, an international umbrella organization that brought together multiple organizations and associations of German-speaking Jews in various countries. It was founded in London uh, right after the Second World War uh, with Dr. Rabbi Leo Beck serving as the council's first chair. The council's work was uh, devoted on one hand to the preservation of German Jewish history and cultural heritage. And one of its most significant contributions on that front was the founding of the Leo Beck Institute in 1954. But the council also saw itself as an official body that represented the interests of German Jewish communities in uh, matters such as uh, reparations agreements or diplomatic relations with West Germany. One of the organizations that came under the wing of the Council of Jews from Germany was Centra, the Association of Jewish Communities and Organizations in Latin America. And this organization was also a suprastructure of smaller organizations, and it operated as something like a federation of German Jewish organizations throughout Latin America. Individual organizations uh, have been established in uh, different Latin American countries in Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Bolivia, other countries already in the 1930s, um, when the first arrivals of Jewish refugees from Central Europe um, arrived in these areas. And the Centra, however, uh, was only established uh, later on uh, after, after the war. The Centra's involvement with the Council of Jews from Germany began in 1958. Uh, one of the first steps that the Council took as part of this collaboration was to plan a survey or a research trip to study the German Jewish communities in different Latin American countries to try to better understand the circumstances of German Jewish life in the region. And for this purpose, uh, the council chose uh, Ernst Simon as its representative to be sent to um, the, on this research travel. Simon was uh, a somewhat prominent intellectual in the German Jewish community. 
Uh, in Germany in the 1920s, he was a close affiliate of Martin Bubo, and uh, he had made a reputation for himself as, as a, um, a religious philosopher, as a scholar, and a pedagogy reformer. He was a Zionist and uh, had migrated to Palestine already in 1928. Zimon's public profile, as well as his expertise um, in education and in pedagogy, made him an ideal candidate for this type of research trip and uh, engagement tour that the council planned in Latin America. So the idea was to send Zimon to a variety of countries where he would meet with uh, local German Jewish communities. He would give public talks about a variety of uh, German Jewish topics and uh, general topics. And he would also get an impression of how these communities in the region uh, were faring, what were some of the challenges that they were facing, and uh, broadly, what the German Jewish life uh, in the region looked like. And of course, a very important byproduct of this tour would have been the strengthening of the collaboration between Centra and the Council, and more significantly, the strengthening of the diasporic bonds, with here a representative of German Jewry in Israel visiting his fellow Landsmannschaft people uh, halfway across the world and celebrating and cementing the diaspora. Zimon spent about uh, seven weeks touring the region um, in the summer of 1958. He uh, began his trip in Rio de Janeiro and traveled from there to Sao Paulo, uh, then continued to Montevideo, Buenos Aires, Santiago de Chile, Lima, and he ended his journey in Mexico City. When he returned to Jerusalem, uh, Zimon authored a very detailed report about his experience and his observations from the visit. And during his, germ uh, his journey, uh, Zimon gave public lectures uh, in almost every city that he visited. He spoke in German, uh, Hebrew, or English on topics like uh, the cultural legacy of German Jewry, new developments in Hebrew literature, Freud as a Jew, uh, or how to educate our children as Jews. These were some of the titles of the talks that he gave. These events were apparently very well attended. Some of them had even uh, gotten a, an audience as big as 750 people, and they gained considerable attention in the local um, German Jewish uh, media, Jewish media, and also non-Jewish media. In his report, Zimon attributed the popularity of his lectures uh, to what he called, I'm quoting, intellectual and emotional longing to the German Jewish cultural climate, end quote. He also believed that there was a certain interest in his own biography and scholarship, uh, since he was known as a pretty prominent intellectual. But importantly, he believed um, that many of the people who came to these events were parents in the community who hoped to uh, learn how to uh, safeguard their children within the community. And here he meant both the Jewish community writ large, but also the German Jewish community specifically. The question of the orientation of the youth towards German Jewishness and towards Jewishness more broadly uh, was emphasized in uh, Zimon's report. Generally, he noted that uh, the youth in the countries that he visited understood the German language, though they uh, seldom read in it, and uh, he um, claimed that they couldn't speak it very well. With some bitterness, Zimon noted that the children of former refugees were acquiring the local culture at a rapid pace, a process that he described as, uh, quote, consuming the fragments of the Jewish culture that their parents still possess and which they attempt to pass on to their children with inadequate means, end quote. In his notes on Rio de Janeiro, uh, Simon remarked that the community there branded itself not as German Jewish, but as liberal, um, here referring uh, to liberal as a religious uh, orientation similar to North American Reform Judaism. And while he uh, thought that this led to the community losing some parts of its German Jewish character, he did uh, acknowledge that the step attracted more youth participation. 
Um, describing his impressions from Buenos Aires, uh, Simon lamented the influence of North American culture on the descendants of German Jews, uh, though he did mention that a significant portion of the children in that community continued to attend the local German Jewish, uh, the German speaking Pestalozzi school, uh, which was a school that was founded uh, in the city in 1934 for the community of refugees from Nazi Germany, uh, Jews as well as non-Jews. Overall, Simon's report um, is filled with contradictions. On one hand, he was not in favor of creating separatist educational programs for German Jewish children, but he did regret the decline of a pronounced German Jewish communal character. He criticized local German Jewish communities for lacking religious education, but he was also uncomfortable with religious programs that lacked, in his opinion, in Zionist content. He reported seeing accelerated assimilation of the younger generation into their immediate local surroundings, but also emphasized the youth's attraction towards uh, American and Eng English language uh, culture. These contradictions, to my mind, they point to a broader difficulty that uh, German Jewish community leaders, people like Simon, had at the time when they tried to define what the future of German Jewishness throughout the diaspora should look like. This question naturally revolved around children and youth and their belonging to or disconnect from the cultural world that their parents still identified with. Zimon's visit to Latin America fleshed out these anxieties. The conditions that Anne Zimon reported on were not particularly unique to Latin American countries. Uh, of course, there were some aspects that he noted that were specific to local circumstances, but the question of how to maintain German Jewish heritage, um, that was a question that was on the minds of community leaders all throughout the diaspora. Despite the fact that these challenges were widespread, uh, the Council of Jews from Germany increasingly perceived the communities in Latin America as especially prone to cultural fragmentation. Following Zimon's visit in 1958, the Council's communications with Centra reveal a dynamic where the Latin American organization was treated as something like the problem child of the diaspora. And this is really apparent in correspondences between uh, Centra uh, leaders and the heads of the councils who were mainly located in England and in Israel. The council, uh, which allocated a budget to each of its members' organizations, at one point even considered limiting Centra's ability to manage their own finances independently. Uh, this would have been unusual since uh, all the other local organizations each had independence to make their own financial decisions. So suggesting that the Centra should be subjected to different standards indicates a level of distrust and suspicion. Ultimately, the idea to limit Centra's independence was not adopted, but the discussion itself tells us something about the relationship between these two organizations. Uh, the ones that are in the dominant centers of the diaspora, and then the ones that were given a peripheral position uh, along this diasporic network. One budgetary item that created disagreement with uh, Centra's funding uh, was uh, a program for a rabbinical seminary. For the council, which was a very pronounced secular organization, this type of activity had no place in the cultural legacy of German-speaking Jewry. The official organizations of Jews in Central Europe often prided themselves of the achievements of secular acculturation. And in the diaspora, that often remained the ethos that um, bodies like the council uh, sought to promote. For Centra, uh, that was deeply confusing. The rabbinical seminary was one of their most successful programs. And they were quite shocked to encounter such a position and uh, uh, anti-religious sentiment as they defined it. Uh, and the central president stated that he was particularly disappointed to see this anti-religious approach coming from the Israeli members of the council. And his surprise, I think, is very telling of a real disconnect that existed uh, between diasporic nodes 
And here I mean not just the diaspora of German speaking Jews, but among world Jewry as a whole. Another recurring source of conflict was the Centra's inclusion of non-German speaking Jews in the organization's activities. For example, Centra uh, organized a youth camp during the summertime and it also uh, accepted children from non-German households uh, to participate in this program. And this initiative struck the wrong chord with members of the council who feared that this was one step towards the dissolution of German Jewish culture. Siegfried Moses, uh, who was the president of the Israel-based organization for Central European immigrants. And at one point he was the chair of the council of Jews from Germany. He formulated this concern in a letter that he wrote to the head of the Centra, Rudolf Hirschfeld, and I'll read to you now a quote from his letter. The work of our council is built on the assumption that the condition of Jews who migrated from Germany legitimates and necessitates an association rooted in a shared cultural origin. We know that the era when this type of organized acti activity is still possible is nearing its end. I personally estimate that it won't be longer than 20 years. We all strive for a closer relationship with non-German Jews in the country of our current residence, but that does not contradict our understanding and our conviction that the continued work on behalf of our fellow countrymen is necessary in the foreseeable future, as is the collaboration of the organizations devoted to this cause under one central association. Uh, we need to understand the comments that Moses is making here as uh, part of a wider concern that was widespread um, and discussed in German Jewish circles at the time. Some even experienced it as an actual crisis. Uh, and that concern was that with Jewish life so thoroughly uprooted from Central Europe, and with the younger generation in the diaspora successfully integrating into their new home countries, that the cultural cohesion of German speaking Jews was under threat of extinction. People like Moses, who dedicated themselves uh, to the preservation of this culture, were seeing the world that they had so cherished uh, beginning to perish before their eyes. The response of the Centra president Hirschfeld was very sympathetic. And he assured Moses that they were sh sharing the same attitudes and that Centra remains uh, a German Jewish organization committed to a German Jewish cultural heritage. But Hirschfeld also insisted that it was uh, counterproductive to prevent the participation of non-German speaking families in Centra's work. And he feared that that would actually just push people away from Centra's um, uh, programs. Moses took this argument to the rest of the council board members who certainly agreed with his position, but they tried to appease him and to promote conciliation. Uh, representatives in London asked Moses, who was in Israel, to take into account that the organizations in Latin America were dealing with issues and problems that they themselves were not familiar with. They had the privilege of working, quote, in countries with Western civilization and cultural standards, end quote, and this distinction had to be taken into account. So this patronizing elitist and even racist language um, may have been intended as a form of reassurance amongst the council members to mean something like, yeah, you know, we're not actually under threat. There's no need to fear uh, what the center is doing. We have our so-called Western civilization in Latin America. They're doing things differently there, but it's okay. Um, that's what the correspondence seem to be implying. Ultimately, though, this uh, questionable ex uh, acceptance of cultural heterogeneity clearly acknowledged that the German Jewish diaspora in its various geographies was not impervious to local influences. And if that was the case, then the question that had to be asked was, at what point do these emerging variations become too wide to bridge? How much local integration is too much? This conflict between the councils and Centra was one of several along those lines, occasionally pushing the council to even consider severing its ties with Centra altogether, uh, though it doesn't seem to have gotten that far. 
uh, at least not from the correspondences that I uh, was reading, but the tensions between these two organizations continued uh, throughout their collaborations. The council's gaze towards Centra was one of paternalism, and this paternalism was deeply shaped by prevalent anxieties about the future of German uh, Jewishness and the German Jewish diaspora. In the collaboration with Centra, the members of the Council of Jews from Germany encountered challenges and problems that they knew very well themselves from the countries that they were living in. In Israel, in England, in the United States, wherever German Jewish communities were uh, displaced to, uh, they were very well integrated into majority societies most of the time. And the number of people for wh whom Central Europe was still the main point of reference uh, was gradually decreasing in the post-war decades. Yet in working with the Centra, the council projected these common challenges onto Latin America as if they were somehow essentially more threatening in that region than they were elsewhere. But ultimately, the way that Centra was observed by the councils um, and the way it, this organization was criticized by the council members, it doesn't actually say all that much about the condition of German speaking Jews in Latin America as it does about tensions and anxieties that uh, German Jewish organizations throughout the world were experiencing in the post-war years. Uh, thank you very much. I'll, I'll mute myself now. Thank you so much, Shirganor. Um, uh, our, our next speaker is uh, Daniela Glazer. Professor, Professor Glazer is an associate researcher at the Institute of Historical Research of the National Autonomous University, the UNAM in Mexico. And her work has focused on the relationship between the Mexican state and foreigners, particularly on immigration and, uh, and naturalization policies. Um, her book, uh, published in 2014, Unwelcome Exiles, Mexico and the Jewish Refugees from, Nazi, from Nazism, 1933-1945, analyzes the Mexican stance towards Jewish refugees during Nazism, questioning the country's open-door myth. Uh, she teaches several graduate and postgraduate history courses at the UNAM, and uh, she belongs to the National System of Researchers, the Latin American Jewish Studies Association, and she's also an affiliate researcher at the Center for Advanced Genocide Research at the University of Southern California. And I will turn it now over uh, to Professor Glazer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to the uh, Center for Holocaust and Genocide Study of the University of Minnesota for the invitation. And especially I want to thank Shir Ganor for organizing this panel. Shir, thank you so much. Uh, you give me the opportunity to know you, to know Liliana, and also to meet again Alejandro and uh, to share this panel with you and know more about your research. So I'm, I'm very happy to be here. And um, I uh, want to share the, the screen. Let me do that. Okay, so uh, I I put the the title of my of my um, paper is the famous and the others political exiles and German Jewish families in Mexico, and uh, what I want to to share with you is this research that uh, is still an ongoing research about uh, the experience of German um, refugees, German exiles in Mexico. But uh, I think we can consider two different experiences. One of the political exiles or the group that I called the famous and the others were that of uh, Jewish families uh, from, uh, from Germany that entered Mexico as Jews and not as political exiles. So uh, first of all, I think we need to um, To, to understand that uh, what well, the famous were a group between 100 and 300 persons 
people that uh, came to Mexico as political exiles with that uh, category of, of political exiles or um, political refugees. And well, I found this photo. I know Maxau was not German from German origin, uh, all the others are. Uh, but these were people very, very, uh, very famous in the moment, very remarkable, like uh, Paul Merkel, who was a member of the Communist Party in, in Germany, or um, the famous writer uh, Anna Segers, uh, Leo Zuckerman, who was also a very high um, functionary in, the, in, the, in Germany. So, um, there is some, some researchers believe they were, that, that was a small group, about 100 people. Others, the, the, the biggest one, the biggest number is 300. So it, it was a small group, but it was a, a, a very uh, important group because, uh, because of the, the weight they had, that they were very, very well known uh, world. So uh, the question is why uh, they were admitted in Mexico? And um, first of all, I have to say that uh, Mexico had a governmental policy that welcomed political refugees in specific situations. That uh, the, the government of Lázaro Cárdenas, that was in power between 1934 and 1940, wanted to protect those who did something to defend freedom those who fought for democracy, or those who dared to raise their vo voices against fascism. This was um, this was a, a foreign. This was part of a foreign policy that was aimed to promote Mexico in the international arena, and that wanted to promote Mexico as a country of open doors, as a as a progressive country and also as an independent country that uh, has its own foreign policy that was not uh, following the USA in this, in this, uh, in these matters, and that uh, it was kind of a reinforcement of the national sovereignty. So, uh, but who were these famous and how was Mexico going to open the doors to them? Well, in 1938, the Minister of Interior uh, declared that the country would only receive as persecuted immigrants those who were prominent fighters for social progress, valiant defenders of republican institutions, or select expositors of science and the arts. So, it was uh, it, it was difficult. Of course, the selection was made by the government. There were, there were some very famous political refugees that were not allowed to enter Mexico. And of course, in these matters, politics always had a lot to do. And the, the work of the political groups that were trying to save people from Europe was very important to determine who were the people that had the chance to enter Mexico. So, in this sense, Mexico was exceptional in opening its doors to political refugees, especially because many of them were communists and were not accepted in many countries. We have to remember that Mexico was the second most important place of German communist exile after the USSR. So it's not only that they didn't mind that they were communists, uh, but that the communists had preference um, had preference uh, from other groups such as, such, such as the Austrian Social Democrats, and that that's something that uh, it's very uh, clear to see when uh, I was analyzing the visas that were. Uh, issued in the Mexican consulate at Marseille, and uh, the, the, most of the people who received a visa from Gilberto Bosques, that were the, was the consul in that moment, they were communist and Stalinist communist, and some other groups, such, such as I said, social democrats or socialists, 
were not receiving visas. So this is a line that I am still working on it, but that there were a, uh, a link or a negotiation or a close relation with the, uh, the Communist Party. Uh, I don't know still if the German Communist Party or the Communist uh, Party in Spain. But uh, some of them, some, some of the people that were uh, received in Mexico were part of the International Brigade. I'm sorry about my English. <laughs> the International Brigades of the Spanish Civil War. So, um, and, and this, this was also because uh, the left in Mexico City, the, the groups of the left were eager to know what was happening in the USSR and were eager to receive communists to, um, to, to know them and to have uh, became in touch with them. The famous uh, were very grateful to Mexico and through their writings expressed their deep appreciation to the country. They were writers and journalists and intellectuals and very famous political refugees. So they contributed to strengthening the Mexican anti-fascist movement founded, uh, for example, the publishing house El Libro Libre or the Free Book, organized lectures and meetings in the most important palace in Mexico City, the Palace of the Bellas Artes, and published also the Black Book of Nazi Terror in Europe in 1943. That was a very, very important book because it was the first uh, prove the first book with photograph about what was happening in Europe and it had a very, very uh, high impact in the people. They also contributed to building Mexico's image as an open door country. And this is, um, I think, something that is, is still, still going on because Mexico is still having this <clears throat> policy of opening its doors to very famous uh, political refugees and this contribute to feed this image of open doors even though the, the, the asylum policy it's very different of the migration policy and this policy uh, it's very it, it's very often confused it's very, very frequently uh, people confuse these two different policies, but what was the policy, the asylum policy, the policy that gave asylum to certain refugees and the migration policy that in general was very close. So the doors were open to them and while many of their less famous co-religionists could not enter the country, this was forgotten over time and the memory or the narrative of Mexico of open doors um, does not include those who were not accepted in the country and those who could not tell their story because they are not here to be interviewed or they didn't write about uh, what happened when Mexico rejected them or when they went to the Mexican consulates in Europe and they did not receive the visas. So uh, I think the narrative of the open doors is a narrative constructed only on the testimonies, on the experiences of those who could enter the country and not includes the experiences of those who were rejected. So as I said, this was a group between 100 and 300 persons. Many of them returned to Germany after the war to build the RDA. And uh, many were murdered by that regime. It's a very sad story because uh, they were accused of uh, of treason and some other some other charges, and uh, they could not return to a normal life or to build the the, the German the socialist Germany. So. Um, Okay, so uh, I, 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 was, um, I made a mistake, so now I'm going to talk about the others, uh, not the famous, but uh, the, the Jewish, the German Jewish families that uh, came to Mexico. And uh, first of all, I have to say that Jewish immigration was forbidden 
among others groups, among others, uh, among other nationalities that were also forbidden in 1934. So Jewish migration was considered the most undesirable of all, but was not the only one that, uh, that was uh, prohibited. The few German Jewish families that arrived were part of the 2,000 Jews that entered Mexico between 1933 and 1945 and were an exceptional case. And now I'm going to explain why they could enter the country, why they were admitted. Um, but there, but uh, there is no database, uh, there is still not a, data, a database on those 2,000 people. It is under construction. Uh, so we still don't know, but I'm going to, to share with you um, a chart, a graphic later to, to see the proportion of, uh, of uh, Jews that enter. Oh, okay. Um, why were they admitted in Mexico, the others? Uh, because the law allowed the entry of relatives of those who had already settled in Mexico years before. So uh, in this in these cases, family networks played a key role. And this is very important because uh, until now, we hadn't recognized the importance of family networks in the migration, the immigration of Jews to Mexico. Uh, we speak of the, we have spoken of the, the governmental, governmental policy or the role that played the, the groups that the political groups that or the Jewish groups that wanted to help and to rescue people from Europe but uh, we haven't we hadn't recognized yet the play the, the importance of the family networks and it played a crucial a crucial um, paper because uh, that was the reason why they could enter the country and it's not that the law allowed the entry of the relatives and if you have a relative you you went to the Minister of Interior and asked for your relative to come. It was very difficult. There was a lot of obstacles that they had to surmount to, uh, to be able to bring the relatives. So it was very difficult. These are some of the last names of the family who, who came to Mexico, but there are many others. Uh, and um, many of the relatives had the necessary information or contacts to, to try to evade these obstacles, but others did not. So the, one of the conclusions of this study is that not only the social capital of the refugees was important, but also the social capitals or capital of the relatives in Mexico. It was very important because sometimes they had to bribe some, some governmental officers Sometimes they had to write, sometimes they had to ask for help. Uh, it was very difficult and they had to be behind the, the process all the time because the process could, could stop in any, in any of the steps. And if someone was not there very aware of, of, this, um, of this obstacle and, and figure out how to, to, to resolve it, how to, uh, to to avoid it, so uh, it was very difficult and the visa won't be uh, get at the fine. Uh, in many cases where visas were obtained for some family members, but not for all, so families came sometimes uh, split up, arrived split up, or uh, some members arrived individually. Many relatives also failed to save their family members and they took this as a personal failure and not as a result of a closed door governmental policy. So this is very important also in terms of memory of what happened with the memory of the families because uh, some of them were very very upset and very depressed about uh, not being able to save their relatives. Mexico uh, was not the first choice for refuge. And this is very important for both groups, both political exiles who did one not, they didn't want to come to Mexico, they, they wanted to go to the United States and also for the German Jewish families who were trying to get visas to other countries first. And Mexico was, I think, even the last choice. Uh, and 
this is important because I think this um, conditionate or this, uh, um, I don't know, uh, I'm sorry, I, I don't remember the, the word in, in English, but I think uh, maybe conditionate is the right, right word. How they, they enter Mexico and how was the process of assimilation because they didn't want to be here. And some of the testimonies uh, speaks about the, that they did not like Mexico, that Mexico was dirty, that the policemen were, were shoeless, were, or with huaraches, with the sandals, Mexican sandals, that uh, there were no rules, that uh, it, it's a very chaotic country. And of course, culturally, Mexico from Germany are very, very distant and they did not feel comfortable. Some of the families stayed in Mexico, but some of them re-emigrated after some years or after some decades. So it's not that Mexico was its final destination for everyone, for some it, it was, but for others, uh, they re-emigrated after that. Uh, this is a talk from a, a work I'm doing with Yael Seaman, that's my colleague, and we're working this together and uh, from Universidad Iberoamericana. And we uh, made a representative database or data sample. Um, and we found that 56% of uh, the Ju German Jews or the Jews in general who came to Mexico uh, came thanks to relatives. Only 20 per 21% uh, thanks to political networks, 15% came independently and 6% with the help of friends, employees, or others. This is um, also um, a graphic that made Yael Seaman with uh, her colleagues, Lorena Avila and Nancy Nichols, and I thank them very much for letting me use this, um, these graphics. And if you see uh, Mexico, I know the colors are not very well differentiated, but Mexico is the one on the top, uh, the green, the middle green in the top, in the top one. So uh, you can see how many Germany, uh, Germans enter. The main nationality uh, of, of Jews who enter Mexico were from Poland. And then we have Romania, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Austria, and Germany, more or less uh, in similar numbers. Well, adaptation to Mexico, as I said, was difficult in general, and it was particularly difficult for women because some of them were used to work in Europe or they had careers or they had some kind of professional development and uh, they could not uh, continue with that in Mexico. So uh, they were like the, 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 there was no place for them in Mexican society. Uh, and they were not used to be in the house. They were not, not used to be housewives. So uh, for women, uh, it, it meant even a, a more difficult um, process of assimilation and process of uh, reinventing their identities, but it, it was ver very difficult. So one of the questions uh, we have in this, in this study is, that if it was more difficult to German Jewish families than to other Jewish families to adapt to Mexico. And uh, I still don't have an answer, but I think uh, this is a, a question that relates with the, uh, what was telling uh, Shir uh, Ganor before me, uh, if the cultural particularities of the German uh, Jewish refugees uh, were something that determined how did they uh, adapt and the organizations they created and what uh, cultural attachments uh, they had. But we still don't have enough information. We have to compare that with what happened with other groups and we are still working on that. Uh, as I said before, many, many of the refugees returned to Europe, but not Germany, not necessarily Germany, they returned to Switzerland or to England or to France or to other European countries where they felt comfortable, but not to Germany itself. Okay, so uh, if we try to compare the two groups, I think these two cases, the case of the famous refugees, political refugees who came to Mexico and the case of the uh, Jewish 
Jewish refugees that came, uh, we can see two sides of the Mexican asylum policy, one that was very generous and one that was very restrictive. Those who could prove they were political refugees entered the privileged group of German-speaking German, German -speaking, uh, exiles, exiles, and those who could not enter as Jews. But as we saw, the Jewish migration was forbidden, forbidden so, so it was very difficult to enter Mexico as a Jew. The Mexican government, government made a differentiation and they speak about political refugees and racial refugees. And racial refugees, they openly said, we were not allowed racial refugees to enter the country because they are not uh, desirable immigrants. So uh, the point is that if we analyze the two groups, there were not so many differences in terms of the people. Many of the German Jews who arrived were less famous political refugees, were not so famous, but had the, the luck to be uh, helped, to receive the help of these political groups and could enter Mexico. And many, um, many of the, of the refugees that entered as Jewish were also political refugees, but could not receive the category of political refugee or political exile and had to enter as Jews. So there are a lot of uh, similarities between the two groups. Uh, but I think uh, the study shows how this study shows how the way in which migration policies categorize people at risk determine their chances of rescue and survival. It also shows how the same government can assume two different policies towards two groups that were not easily differentiated, but it they, but as as they uh, created these two different categories. They split people in these two groups, but as I said, they were not, uh, not, not so easily uh, differentiated. And the narrative of Mexico as an open door country only recovers the experience of the German speaking political exiles, but excludes the experience of those who were rejected. And this is, I, I, I have said that in, in, in other books, in other, in other places, but I think it's very important because um, I think not in Mexico, but historiography outside Mexico continue to, uh, to repeat this narrative of Mexico as an open door. Something that uh, historians in Mexico have uh, criticized very, very hardly in the last years, but outside Mexico, Mexico is still known as a country of open doors, as a, uh, the political German speaking exile, uh, and, and I think it's very important uh, to try to, to criticize this, this image and to try to make a more complex image of how was the political uh, migration policy and asylum policy in that, in, that, in that years. And that's why I really appreciate that you have invited me to this panel. Thanks a lot. Thank you uh, so much, Daniela, and um, thank you for complexifying that, that picture about Mexico as a safe haven for, for refugees. Um, um, I'm sure several of the attendees will have a question, so we will ha have an opportunity after the next speaker to pose them. So I would like to introduce our third speaker, um, Liliana Ruth Feierstein, who is a professor for transcultural Jewish history and head of the Department of Cultural Theories at the Humboldt, Uni uh, Humboldt University in Berlin. And her current research topics include ethics, religion, psychoanalysis, as uh, these topics relate to violence, the phenomenon, on, the phenomenon of the disappeared, and mourning. She is also interested in how narratives of the Shoah have been incorporated in representations of Latin American dictatorships. Uh, Professor Feierstein has published widely on Jewish literature and philosophy, on theories of translation, on memory, and on the intergenerational transmission of trauma. 
So I will um, pass it on uh, to uh, Liana Firestein now. So can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Vielen Dank. Uh, muchas gracias, Alejandro, Cher, and Joe for the invitation. I'm also very happy to be here with you and uh, have the opportunity to share my research with you and I will all to discuss with you about my uh, research on uh, German Jewish speaking um, refugees in Latin America. Um, also for all of you about all of the women, uh, I'm happy to be here in the International Women Day with you. I will only put it in the slogan in Spanish, uh, Pani Rosas para las mujeres, for the women who are here. So um, we are going to go back in my presentation more um, to South America and to the Centra and I will, I will um, speak about all about the rabbis and the religious traditions and uh, also to the foundation of the Seminario Rabbinico Latino Americano. So it was uh, very nice that Cher was um, uh, telling a, a bit about the history from the other side, from the center of the Centra in uh, London and Israel and uh, also in North America. And I will put more ambition uh, from the South and uh, because Today is a woman day. I was trying to um, put a bit the light on woman, which is difficult if you are working about rabbis, but uh, I still try it and I hope I soothe it somehow. So uh, let me uh, share with you my PowerPoint and um, I will just begin. So. Uh, my work uh, today is the name is the heritage of Breslau and we'll, you will understand now uh, quickly why. On the 18th July of uh, 1994, the central building of the AMIA, the central organization of the Jewish communities in Buenos Aires, was destroyed by a car bomb. Maybe you have heard about that. The attack was, as far as I know, the most severe one against a Jewish institution after 1945 worldwide. 85 people lost their lives there, more than 300 were injured, and an important part of the best Jewish library in Latin America was burned. Lamrota Kol, trotz allem, in spite of it all, just some weeks later, the Argentinian community were celebrating Jewish life again for an extraordinary new reason, the ordination of the first female rabbi in Latin America, Margit Baumatz. It could be interpreted as a manifestation of life in the face of death, even more so as this event's resonance crossed time, time and space back to Europe. Then Margit herself was born in Breslau in 1938, the same year the pearl of liberal Judaism in Central Europe, the Jewish Theological Seminary, was closed by the Nazis. Her ordination as a rabbi decades later on in Argentina seems to close a circle of life before, beyond death. And uh, you see here Margaret of the left side and on the right side, you see it, um, Regina Jonas, who was the first woman ordained as a rabbi, of course, a German one, of course, in Berlin, in the Weimar Republic in 1935. Regina Jonas was murdered in Auschwitz. And after that, we have a uh, wait in the Jewish history till 1972 uh, to have a second ra female rabbi, which was Sally Prison in the, the United States. And as I say, then Margaret, the first one in Latin America, 1994. Lamrota Kohl, in spite of all, was precisely the name of a German speaking Jewish community in North Buenos Aires where Margit Baumatz grew up and where she celebrated her bat mitzvah as one of the first girls on the subcontinent because the celebration was one of the things imported by the liberal Jews. 
The rabbi in Lambrota Call was Paul Hirsch. You'll see here a photo of the bat mitzvah. Paul Hirsch. And that's not, uh, it's not a mistake in the slide. It's not Cary Grant, it's the right slide. This is our rabbi, Paul Hirsch, which I can tell you was uh, uh, very, very um, funny when I was uh, doing my interviews in Buenos Aires because every woman over 70 who has no rabbi, Paul Hirsch, when I was asking about him, was like, oh, Paul. And then, you know, the interview was kind of difficult, but okay, that was Paul Hirsch. He was born in Aachen. He was educated in the Breslau Seminary and become known as both a feminist and a kind of uh, progressive rabbi. He installed a uh, bat mitzvah for the girls already in the beginnings of the 50s, as I said, and more terrible for the whole community as a rabbi, he was married to a Protestant woman. Paul Hirsch, uh, Paul Hirsch was one of the more than 20 Central European German-speaking rabbis and cantors who arrived in Latin America mostly before the war, but a few also came as survivors. In fact, he was one of more than 100,000 German-speaking refugees who, whose lives were saved in Latin American exile. Although one must take into consideration that the main chapter of the Jewish history in Latin America did in fact take place in Yiddish and partly in Ladino, the flood of German speaking immigrants had a certain impact not only on Jewish life, but in Latin American society in general. For me, in my research, uh, I think I see three groups who were quite influential, uh, psychoanalysts and scientists, artists, and uh, think only on the, of the day of the um, Bauhaus, and uh, rabbis and cantors. Um, due to this religious liberal development in which I will focus today in the rabbis, <clears throat> the main current in Latin American Judaism in no ways is Masorti, the conservative Judaism, which is, a, and we can speak in, uh, after about that, but it's a very interesting uh, thing because actually the Yekes, the German, speaking Jews were um, less than 10% of the communities in the subcontinent and in Argentina as well. The new beginning in South America was not easy. They had uh, lost nearly everything in Europe and they were confronted with already established Jewish community, which they did not understand. And I think this point is very important. As Rab Rabbi Esteban Vegasi Klein, who came from Hungary, was educated in the rabbinical seminary in Budapest after the war. He was a survivor for a very, very huge family for more of 100 people, the only one, and immigrated to Chile after in the 60s. Uh, he put this in an interview. In religious matter, there was no liberal Judaism in Latin America. It was everything or nothing. And I think when he's saying everything, he says, of course, groups like Bundist and communist, socialist, anarchist, or the orthodoxy, but not Jewish uh, liberal um, Judaism, as you have, have of course, um, in, in the United States. The immigrants felt alienated by the existing communities. They longed for the Gemeinden as they had been back in Europe. They wanted to pray in German, to have a Dr. Rabina, which is really a very special thing from Breslau. They wanted to have an organ and to listen to the melodies of Louis Lewandowski. They did not have so much contact with the rest of the Jewish institution of the beginning in the diverse countries, but rather with the other German Jewish community worldwide, where then they form an impressive network of religious, social, and communitarian institutions. And as Cher was speaking about that, Centra, but also like newspaper, like Aufbau and other kind of, <coughs> of um, communal uh, projects. In Latin America, they did a huge translation work and uh, cultural work, but sometimes even literally, like uh, Rabbi um, Fritz Pinkus, who have been rabbi in Heidelberg and um, flee to Brazil and founded the uh, Jewish um, German speaking community in Sao Paulo. And in 1949, he published the first prior book, a Maxor <coughs> entry written in Portuguese. This monumental work was an adaptation of the standard prayer book 
Anheitsgebetsbuch of the liberal German speaking community in Europe, first published in the Weimar Republic uh, 1929, of course, in Breslau. The Machsor was followed by the publication of Asidur and other didactical works for the dissemination of the history and basic concept of Judaism. And you have to think about that before that we haven't had any prayer books in Spanish or in Portuguese. So it was really a very interesting work they have uh, done there. The continuation of the tradition and the education of the next generation were the health of the exiled rabbis work in these countries. With this goal in mind, and um, that is interesting uh, now in the bridge to the, um, <clears throat> to the contribution of SHARE, because for me, with this goal in mind, I man managed to find an umbrella organization in 1956, this Sandra, which assembled more than 20 Central European congregation in nine different countries in Latin America. And from the view from the thought, the most important achievement of the Centra was indeed the creation of the Latin American Rabbinical Seminary in Buenos Aires in 1962. And that's very, very clear in the document of the Centra of the first conference in Montevideo. Uh, you see here some of the rabbis in Montevideo. It's also very interesting to ask why Montevideo. We can speak about that. And um, um, you see that it's very nice uh, on the on the left side Artigas, the national hero uh, of Uruguay, uh, of the independence of Uruguay, and on the right side um, the um, picture of Herzl. <clears throat> The bridge between the three different Jewish culture, cultures in Latin America, the German-speaking Jews, also the Yekes, the East European and the Sephardim, was a difficult challenge and was fastly forgotten by Marshall Maya, a neutral young rabbi. And should, uh, sorry, that's uh, an article about the creation of the Centra in Montevideo. <clears throat> Marshall Maya, a young rabbi disciple of Abraham Joshua Heschel, you probably know him, who came to Buenos Aires, Maya, in 1959, so one year after, and, and Simon had been there, and three years after of the creation of the Centra. You see here in the left side, uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel, and uh, beside him, Masha Maya. Incredibly charismatic, Maya translated between the Jewish communities and later on, and that's for me a very interesting point also, he was a central figure on the Jewish community in its resistance against the dictatorship during the 70s and the early 80s. And you see there Maya on the left side, together with Hermann Schiller, who was a um, Marxist journalist. They um, founded together a Jewish movement for human rights. And it's a very nice anecdote of that I know from my father, because the journalist was always going to Schiller and saying to him, uh, her rabbi um, is a rabbi, and uh, Sheila, you see the, the bath, and then uh, uh, Sheila say, no, no, I'm a Marxist, the rabbi is, uh, is Marshall beside me. So uh, I cannot go into much further detail, but the connection between the Central European rabbis in Latin America and the North American rabbis was quite interesting. I'm just beginning to reconstruct it. Strikingly, most of the Yekes were oriented towards reform Judaism in religious matter, but at the same time were rather conservative in politics, with the exception of Paul Hirsch and Heinrich Lemle, he was in <coughs> Rio de Janeiro. With the upcoming dictatorships in Latin America countries, the tension inside the communities grew. Also, or maybe because most of the German rabbis had been in concentration camps, at least some week or months after Kristallnacht. Most of the Jägers tried to keep a politic of no intrusion in human rights issues, while the American rabbis, the North American, but also the South Americans, uh, regarded it as their ethical duty to do what they could in order to speak up, up against the atrocities which uh, were happening in the countries. So anyway, our Yeke rabbis were revolutionaries in other ways. Most of them were pioneers of the ecumenical movement in spite of everything they had lived through or maybe exactly because of it. They worked towards the creation of an interreligious dialogue. 
Uh, I would like to mention here the extraordinary friendship between Rav Ravi Hirsch and uh, Father Pauli, who used to preach together and organize joint service in both the synagogue and the church, which caused a scandal in the deep Catholic Argentina in the 60s. Like the incorporation of women in religious life, the economical dialogue is a part of the heritage that bore fruits we are still able to observe today. You see there Rabbi Abraham Skorka, former rector of the Seminario Rabinico, stressed that his groundbreaking friendship with Pope Francis would not have been possible without the commitment of his predecessors in the Jewish Catholic dialogue on the 50s and 60s. And Skorka was the direct successor from Paul Hirsch as rabbi in the com community La Rota Col. And maybe just an anecdote, but uh, last year were some Argentine rabbis uh, as a visit in the Vatican, and it was the first time in the Vatican that it was um, cooked kosher food for them. Of course, not only uh, men had brought the Breslau heritage uh, to South America. I have to say that the longer I work in this topic, I come across more and more interesting women. I just started this part of my research when I was doing interviews about the rabbis because a lot of people told to me things like, well, the rabbi was okay, but you should have met the rabbetzin. That was the soul of the community. One of these rabbetzin was Susanna Hallenstein de Haaf, you see her here, who held a doctoral degree in philosophy from the University of Hamburg, had graduated in li library studies in Uppsala, and work in the Hochschule für die Wissenschaft des Judentums by Leo Beck in Berlin as a librarian before fleeing to Buenos Aires, just to remind that woman um, in this time in, in Argentina, um, woman they could not even vote. Uh, the vote right for women in Argentina was in 1951, so 47 was uh, the rule and then 51. So it was just a distance through this woman who came from the Weimar Republic and the woman in Argentina. And Susie Hallenstein, the heart was a very, very interesting person on that. The um, title of my lecture today, The Breslau Heritage, does not only refer to Breslau as a geographical place with biographical importance of certain key figures of the Jewish German speaking exile. The name of Breslau itself represents a tradition that started in 1854 with the foundation of the Jewish Theological Seminary in a wider sense, a point of crystallization of a part of the Central European Judaism. Even if Margit Baumat was, as I said, born in Breslau and Paul Hirsch had studied there, like many other rabbis and cantors, Margit did her rabbinical study at the Seminary in Buenos Aires. <clears throat> the Breslau heritage marked the style of her teachers and also of the librarian Suse Hallenstein, who, I quote Margaret in an interview, ran these magnificent libraries in a pure Yekish style. An immense amount of the books of the library were brought from the Yekish in the luggage, real treasures. And if you one day are in Buenos Aires, I really invite you to take a look of this um, library of the seminary. It's really like incredibly <coughs> treasure of German Jewish um, books. But more than that, even some <coughs> Torah scroll of these communities were saved from the devastation in Europe and represented material and symbolic heritage of this tradition. As Heinrich Heine wrote, die Juden, welche sich auf Kostbarkeit und Verstehen, wussten sehr gut, was sie taten, als sie bei dem Brande des zweiten Tempels die goldene und silberne Opfergeschirre, die Leuchter und Lampen, sogar den hohen priesterliche Brutzlatz mit den großen Edelsteinen im Stich ließen und nur die Bibel retteten. Diese war der wahre Tempelschatz. The homiletic teacher of Margit Baumat <clears throat> war Hans, uh, was Hans Haaf. He was also the rabbi of the Jewish community where I grew up. So maybe therefore I'm doing this research <laughs> because uh, it was a very a kind of, uh, of strange situation. I come from a Polish, a Polish a Jewish family and it was um, like experimental to be in a um, Yeke community in Buenos Aires in the 70s. 
Anyway, Harf has studied not in Breslau, but in Berlin at the Hochschule with Leo Beck. In his interview for Spielberg Testimony Project, Ravi Harf narrates that in 1939, after having been interned in the concentration camp Oranienburg, and after having received as Micha on a rabbinical ordination of emergency, as they um, called them because he was not um, finished, but still. And that's interesting, that's a very bad copy of this Micha, but maybe you can see that in the middle of his name, Hans Harf, it wrote Israel. And I had like a shock as I realized that uh, 1939, even in the rabbinical ordination, uh, they they needed to put, as the Nazis uh, say, the name Israel for the men, for the Jewish men. Um, after then um, having his emergency smicha, um, a parcel had reached him some days before his leaving uh, of Germany, and inside was a Torah. Not any scroll, but the one his father has rescued during the so-called Kristallnacht in his hometown, Mont Mönchengladbach. It was the last thing Hans Harf received from his parents. Uh, they were murdered in the Shoah, also the parents of uh, the wife of uh, Suse. He put the Torah in his lagat, covered by the rest of his belongings, hoping to pass the control of the Gestapo, which somehow did happen for some inexplicable reason. As in Heine's text concerning the destruction of the Second Temple in Jerusalem, this Torah was the only lagat the couple half broke with them, and symbolically, the only luggage all the other rabbis and Hassanim and religions led up both as well when fleeing from Europe. The Britain text was the real treasure, the word, the covenant, the Judaism. Our <clears throat> central European rabbis, as they love to call themselves, built a bridge between the Judaism they learned on the old continent and the new generation born in the south. A beautiful, small example of this dialogue between generations are the souvenirs of Irene Leschnitzer of her bat mitzvah in Buenos Aires in the Leo Beck Synagogue by Rabbi Steinhalt. She spoke to the community in German, giving an interpretation of the Shema Israel. You see that of the uh, right side, and you see also the young girl becomes visible on, in her handwriting. On the left, the dedication of Ravi Steinhalt in the book she received as a present for her bat mitzvah, a quotation of Prophet Micha in Spanish. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. What does God require of you but to act justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God? They walk the long way from Breslau to the southern ends of the planet. Lam Rotakol, trotz allem, in spite of all. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Feierstein, for this very illuminating and, and moving presentation. And thank you all the, the, the speakers for, um, for their input, for fascinating presentations. We now have, um, we still have time, I would say, if we can go a little bit over 1.30, so we have time for our um, attendees, our participants to, to intervene, to ask questions, maybe to supplement uh, if they have comments from their own either their own work, their own scholarship, or their own experience. So you just have to raise your hand and we will open the microphone for you and the camera. And uh, everybody is welcome to, to participate. So, um, I, yeah, maybe here we have already Amy, um, Amy Kaminsky, a colleague here in Minnesota. I think you can, you can talk now. And, if you if you click on your camera, we will also, we will also see you. I just got a phone call. I don't see my camera, um, unfortunately. But it's fine. I, we can hear I, you. I just want to thank you so much for 
an extraordinary um, panel. I, I feel like I learned so much. Um, I come from literature and there, I just wanted to suggest a couple of novels that I truly love um, that I've worked on about Jews and Germans in Argentina. And the reason my voice is like this is while I was talking to you, my doorbell rang and my book just turned up. I wish I could show it to you. It's The Other Argentina, Jews, Gender and Sexuality in the Making of Modern Nation. It just, it just arrived on my doorstep. But two of the books that I talk about in it um, are by Jose Pablo Feynman, um, La Sombra de Heidegger, which has been translated into English as Heidegger's Shadow, a wonderful, wonderful novel by a man who has, uh, he's a philosopher as well as a novelist and he's written screenplays as well. And the novel is about um, the son of a, an imaginary uh, disciple of Heidegger's who's trying to figure out how to rescue Heidegger from his being, having been a Nazi. Um, and it's a brilliant, brilliant work. And the other is um, Edgardo Kosarinsky's Lejos de Donde, which has not been translated, but is about, uh, has as its central character, uh, a woman who was a, a low level bureaucrat in a concentration camp who takes on the identity of a Jewish woman in order to get herself through the so-called rat lines into Argentina. And again, an extraordinary novel. So if people are interested in the literary, in a literary approach to some of these questions, that's one of them. So thank you. Again, thank you very much. All three of these, these presentations were just spectacular. Thank you, Amy. And uh, we have a question here. You can see it, Daniela, right? There's a question. Um, for you on the chat. Yes, thank you, Alejandro. Okay, the first one, uh, how much influential were the Camisas Doradas, the Golden Shirts, and the pro raza Committee <clears throat> in the Mexican immigration law in the 30s, is that they were not very influential. Uh, these were groups of the right wing, the far right wing, uh, very uh, noisy groups. They very. They made a lot of um, parades in Mexico City, downtown, and a lot of um, manifestations and that. But uh, there were not political important groups. I think the most important uh, reasons for this very strict uh, immigration policy in the thirties was that. Um, after the Mexican Revolution, there was a recovering or revalorization uh, of the Mexicans and a very xenophobic uh, attitude towards strangers, to, uh, towards foreigners. And this idea that um, Mexican population was a result of the miscegenation, the mestizaje, the, the mixing of races and that uh, the government or the state had to protect that population from strange influences. So I think it was more related to this thinking or this uh, racial view of uh, the Mexicans and the foreigners and, and an adaptation of the, the, the classic racial theory to the Mexican reality that of course, they could not defend the purity of race because Mexicans were a result of a mixing, but that this was a very particular mix that you had to protect. So it was very xenophobic and, and very, very, um, and, and, and this created that a, a very restrictive immigration policy. Uh, foreigners were, were splitting Assimilable, I don't know if that's a word in English because I don't know if that's a word in Spanish, assimilable or un, 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 non-assimilable uh, foreigners. And then they were, they were categorized as desirable or non-desirable foreigners. So Jews 
were, of course, uh, in the category of non-desirable. Um, but I, I think there is some kind of debate in Mexican historiography about uh, the political uh, weight of these groups as the Golden Shirts or the Comité Plural, or the Comité uh, de, la clase, de la Clase Media, etc. But uh, between th those historians who believe that they had a lot, of, uh, a lot of importance, that they had a lot of weight, and those who believe they don't, I think I'm in the last group. Uh, but of course, we have very impressive photograph of these um, these parades or these manifestations in in Mexico City, very very with the swastikas and all of that. The second question is: uh, It seems that Jewish immigration in Mexico decreased after 1934 and especially after 1938. Uh, what was the source, I think, of the 2,000 Jews who entered Mexico between 1933 and 1945. The main source is then the foreigner register, the national foreigner register, uh, but it's not a very reliable source because a lot of foreigners lied when they enter. I, I found the, the, the card of my husband's grandfather and it was everything a lie. He, he was a German Jew and he said he was born in Barcelona. His mother tongue was, uh, was Spanish, even though he had a strong German accent and that he was a Protestant and he was Jewish. So everything was a lie in that, in that register. So, but that's the main source to, to work with. And uh, I think uh, Jewish immigration decreased after uh, 1929. Actually, not 1934, because 1929 was when the government um, forgave the enter of Russians and Polands. So that affected uh, very much Jewish immigration. And because uh, it started the Mexican migration policy to, to um, put some, some uh, obstacles to the enter of uh, foreigners who wanted to work, to workers. So it affected a lot of the Mexico, but there were still some entries from 1929 to 1934. And then the prohibition of 1934, the circular 157 that uh, forgave the entrance of Jews, uh, of course, limited even more the entrance, the entrance of Jews. Uh, and it's interesting to say that the Jewish community in Mexico, which has now nearly 40,000 people, was a result of the immigration of the 20s. Uh, then before all this uh, limitation and prohibition and, and yeah limitation uh, start to 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 operate to be in place, I think that's. I, I hope I I, I could uh, answer both. Um, thank you. Um, if it's okay to pose one question here before we end, so and maybe there are some others who still want to do it. Uh, um, Daniela, you have you have mentioned something that you said you don't have an answer at this point, but maybe this, this is a question for for the three of you. How difficult it was to adapt for the German Jewish refugees in Latin America in comparison to other Jewish refugees? I think this is, a, this is a, such an, a, an important question. And when I think of the term Yeke that Liliana has used, which is this nickname that has given, but that already uh, indicates uh, some sort of, of uh, inability to let go of, uh, of the original habitus uh, from Germany I, I don't know if this, I mean, of course, it's a stereotype, but how, my question is, how uh, fitting is the stereotype, whether really that um, inability to adapt based on the, maybe the incapacity of really assuming the fate of Jewish refugees as many others, and there's a great passage from in, in Stefan Zweig, uh, it's no, um, biography, autobiography, in the world of yesterday, when he talks about uh, um, I think it's in 1940 in London, um, a travel agency, and he describes the, the sort of mental desolation of the German Jews versus the Polish or, or other more, more the traditional Jews that were less assimilated, that were more capable of, um, of accepting what was what was happening to them, that were actually they were persecuted as Jews, and then maybe it was also 
easier for them to uh, integrate into a new context, into a completely different environment. So just a question for the three of you, just curious to, to see what you think. I would actually really be happy to hear Liliana's response to that as someone who may even have some personal uh, responses. You, said, you mentioned your biographic experience there and I'm really interested in learning more about that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank you. It's it's a good question, Alice. I think um, the first thing is also that Latin America is very diverse. So one of the of the main discussion, uh, for example, inside the center was uh, between Brazil and Chile. The rabbis in Brazil wanted to go over to Portuguese, and in Chile they spoke German in the communities. I don't know, maybe till now I have no idea. So it was very very hard. I mean because uh, also. Chile is very very different to Brazil, so there are there are some some difference, but still I think something in the stereotype is, is true. It uh, was not such. Uh, I mean, there were there's always uh, exception, but there were not such of um, a will to integration and see. I think of the communities and uh, well, it was also an idea. It's not the same. For me, I think as a German Jew to be in, in London or in New York as to be in Latin America. So um, it was for me a kind of looking for all from over, you know, that's that these wild people, you know, they have no civilization. And I mean, also this love to the German culture and language, which of course not was not shared with the other um, with the other um, German uh, Jewish communities so so far I think it, it was but I see as I say in the different communities is very very different and I think like in Brazil uh, there was a very good adaptation of the Yekes and I think it has to do also to uh, with the Brazilian uh, society and in Argentina there were so much I mean the Yekes founded like six or seven communities uh, in Buenos Aires, and they are the, the biggest community now, you know, the religious communities. So um, they have had like their life. And I think it makes it uh, like you uh, told Alejandro at the beginning, it makes it like in the eighties or nineties, but not before. And still now, like if you go to Lambrota Col, most of the, uh, not of the members, but of the dirigencia, you know, the, the people who are running that, most of them are still, I mean, uh, children and grandchildren of the founders, and for sure, most of them are German speaking Jewish families. If I could just say, I think that uh, I uh, agree with what Liliana said, and I think that there are a couple of distinctions that need to be made first between socioeconomic integration and cultural integration, which I think were separate uh, issues, uh, especially for um, immigrants from uh, German Jewish background, and uh, that the stereotype is in many ways itself propagated. And I think that the self propagated stereotype is in itself indicative of that need to preserve uh, a cultural uh, particularity um, that is maybe constructed and maybe nostalgic, uh, but it's still there. If I may, uh, very short to give one example, I think um, a colleague was ma making an, uh, an research about uh, the nationality of the Yekes. If they took the um, Argentine or Brazilian passports or didn't. And that's very interesting because most of them in, in, in Hirsch, uh, in this, you know, um, resident for all people, denied to take the Argentine pass. They didn't want to. Uh, and I was thinking in my Zayde, in my, my um, grandfather who came from Poland, and he always talk about that the day he become uh, his uh, Argentine passport was the happiest day in his life. He was so proud of it. He didn't want to have anything to do with Polish people anymore. Yeah, and that was such a difference. I mean, uh, I of course there are all kind of people everywhere, but I think it's it's kind of say something about that. Yeah. <clears throat> sure. I just want to say that um, let I think Latin America is. Uh, it's very different. It's not the same Buenos Aires that uh, um, Rio or, or Montevideo or Mexico City or uh, Guatemala City. 
Uh, so we speak of Latin America as a region, uh, but there is no homogeneity or not, not, it's not so, so similar. I was born in Buenos Aires. Uh, I, I lived in Buenos Aires uh, until I, I was 12. And then I, I, my parents moved, moved to Mexico and I had to move with them. Um, I love Mexico. I, I, am, I am Mexican and, and, and I love Mexico a lot. But uh, I think coming from, from Europe, it's, uh, it's very different uh, arriving uh, uh, to Buenos Aires than arriving to Mexico City. Uh, these are two very different countries with different people, culture, everything different. So I don't know, I think it will be very interesting to compare how they did adapt to Buenos Aires or to Montevideo or to other countries, because I think the experience is very different. Uh, as Liliana said, the, the, the society of reception had a lot, of, a, a lot to do of how, how did they uh, integrate or not. I also would like to, to I think it, it would be very interesting to see how many stayed, uh, refugees, Jewish refugees, how many stayed in, in Buenos Aires or in other countries uh, uh, comparing to Mexico and how many re-immigrated or move again after a few years because I think that's uh, one of the um, indicators of integration or some of them could not integrate and decided to, to move again. I had this feeling that in Mexico it, it was more difficult for, for German Jews than for others, but it's still something intuitive. I have to, to prove it or to have more data to, to make such an affirmation. But I think that living in a country, and I say that uh, from the testimonies that uh, I have heard and, and read, they said, uh, I think it was very difficult for them to live in a country with no rules. It was, they, they were becoming crazy because they couldn't understand how work, how the things work. So I think that was um, not so much the, if they were much or less integrated to, to their countries of origin, but I think Mexico in particular was very difficult for them. But I, I repeat something more intuitive that uh, the conclusion of our research still. Yeah, uh, yes, please. Sorry, I, I know it's late. It's only uh, one comment for share for you, because I think it's very interesting um, to see, you know, I think in Latin America, we have had not so many intellectuals as in the North. So who went to Latin America? Nobody wanted to go there, yeah? And then <clears throat> the rabbis decided in the center to make this of the center of the work. And my question was a bit from the South, maybe they were right because they were totally successfully. Masorti is the most important uh, way now in Latin America to leave Judaism. And the other question is what uh, remains from, this, from the Council of German Jews in the North? And uh, it's just an open question, but I, I was uh, thinking of that when you, sp you speak. <clears throat> Um, I, today, the, the council is no longer active, um, and so th that is also what I mean. That uh, this, the the same things that they, the same anxieties that they were projecting when they were looking at the centralized work were actually their own. Um, and um, I think that in many ways, uh, the the anxieties were a simulation of the German Jewish community, not so much into the majority society of Latin American countries, which. In, in most of these countries were, was probably less uh, complete than in the United States or in Israel, but the assimilation of German Jews with the other Jews, uh, which is what uh, uh, was their uh, main source of concern in, in these decades. Later on, it becomes less of a, once it becomes, of course, an inevitable thing, but in the 50s and 60s, that, that was really the fear that was uh, animating these conflicts. Um, and, and the religious uh, Masoti versus liberal uh, uh, conflict was one of these uh, as well. And it was actually a surprise for me to see that the council rejected the promotion of liberal Judaism because it was in a way, a, a way to preserve German Jewish heritage rather than uh, to abandon it. 
that is really fascinating. No, it's a good. Uh, it's a good point to end. No, the question was not assimilation into the country; it was assimilate, assimilation into the the non-German Jewish culture of those uh, uh, right in these environments in these countries. Fascinating. Um, and uh, maybe on that note, um, and I see there are no more questions. Uh, we have been losing our participants, but there's still 11 attendees with us. We have been brave enough. To, uh, to, to accompany us through this uh, long but fascinating uh, Zoom session. So I just want to end here and, and thank you uh, all for, for your presentations and for, for contributing to this, to this important discussion. Um, thank you all and have a, have a great rest of the day. Thank you, Alejandro. Thank you, Shir. Many thanks, thank everyone. Thank you to, to everyone. Bye. Gracias. Gracias.